distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker on um, actually uh, covers, wind, uh, uh, small tunnels, big tunnels, uh, growing the right kind of food uh, for healthy lifestyles. Uh, Tom Stilley is a principal owner of Interpretive Gardens and also uh, the River School in Reno. Probably many of you know him. That's why we've got such a good crowd here, Tom. <laughs> Thank please, you for coming. Please welcome Tom Stilley. Thanks, Steve, for inviting me here. I think I was here for the first one of these. Yes. yes. And Craig Witt and I spoke in a big tent. And uh, it's always nice to be before Craig rather than after because Craig is such a nice uh, speaker and is uh, full of animation and so forth. So my real passion is advocating, uh, teaching, and demonstrating how to grow food year-round, nutrient-dense, in small urban areas. So really that's what we're, we're going to talk about uh, today. And uh, we're going to really talk about first what is a superfood and a little bit about foods and the kind of foods we can grow here that are really, really good for us and that will extend our lifestyle and, and, uh, and feel good about ourselves when we're, when we're eating these kind of foods. And then how do we grow this food year round? So that's kind of what I'm going to talk about. But before I go any further, I'd like to ask a few questions. Firstly, who grows some of your food? Raise your hand. All right. So who grows food year-round here? OK, good. And so how do you grow food year-round in? Mostly low tunnels. Or low tunnels. Powers. OK. Who pops? Who pops? All right. So, I should have a really attentive audience here. Who wants to grow food year round? Or at least some food. All right. So uh, I think we're, we're right on here. So uh, a lot of people define superfoods in many different ways. Some people uh, define a superfood from something that grows in South America that's got unique qualities that if you eat it, it will you know, save you from all kinds of things. What I consider a superfood is really uh, what I gleaned from these two books. Um, they're book by Stephen Pratt. And the first one that came out was this superfood, uh, Rx. And he talks about 14 superfoods. And uh, I'm just going to read them really quickly here. Uh, what's interesting about the way he writes this book is that he really documents it really well with lots of research. Um, and he. Uh, he picks one flagship, what he calls a flagship superfood, and then he has lots of sidekicks. So for example, uh, walnuts is one of his superfoods, but the sidekicks are really all the nuts. So when you think about uh, superfoods, think about categories of foods. So nuts is, is one category. And uh, another example is his superfood. Uh, flagship is blueberries. But then he, he suggests that all berries, all berries are superfoods. So the kind of berries that we can grow here, raspberries and blackberries, currants, gooseberries, those are all really good for us and all superfoods. So see if I got enough light here and I'll read this. Beans, uh, and I, I always think of beans as dried beans. And uh, it was interesting to see the solar cooker out here because I get in a routine of the night before I soak my beans. Uh, in the morning, I put them in the solar cooker, and they're ready by noon. 
and uh, these are such a, a great part of a meal because they substitute so much of the meat that, that uh, you know, is expensive now and uh, it's a lot more healthy if they're eating beans rather than meat. So I mentioned blueberries, broccoli, oats. Oats is another good example. Um, we have a hand grinder. I grind my oats and make oatmeal in the morning. But also, all the grains are superfoods, as long as they're not processed too much. So wheat, barley, all of these, uh, rice, all these are considered superfoods, especially if they're not processed too much. Oranges, a flagship, all of the citrus. And the idea is that we should be eating as many of these groups every day as we can. And, and, and that is going to hopefully keep us healthy. Pumpkin, all the winter squash, all the summer squash is another group that we can grow here and do very well at. Um, a fun thing about pumpkin is that one of those things we can grow in the summer, but we can eat it all winter long. And uh, we think a pumpkin is, uh, is for jack o lanterns but uh, pumpkin and all the winter squashes are extremely good for us. And like I said, it's something that we can grow in our long growing season. And usually I have my last winter squash, you know, around March or April. If you keep them in a cool place, they will really last quite well. Wild salmon, well, we can't do much there. If you're on the Truckee River, you can maybe go catch a trout. Uh, soy is another one of his superfoods. Uh, spinach and all of the greens are considered superfoods. Tea, green tea, black tea, all the teas. He raves about teas. Um, if you're a coffee drinker and if you can somehow get off coffee and get on to tea, it's so much more healthy for us. Um, I drink decaf tea and I drink it pretty much all day long every day. Uh, and I switch between Earl Grey and black and green. And that kind of mixes it up for me. Uh, tomatoes. Uh, who went out and tasted tomatoes over here? It wasn't that fun. Uh, I like the really the best one is the real small orange ones. They have this really unique flavor, and uh, they're, they're good producers for us. So tomatoes are a really awesome food. Turkey, and what he he talks about turkey and, and chicken breast. So who grows chickens in their backyard? All right, you know, in 20 years, I think when I'm giving this speech here, heaven or God for it, you know. Uh, a lot more of you are going to raise your hands because uh, as we get into peak oil and as it becomes food becomes more and more expensive because of cost of oil, you, you all know that our commercial agriculture is driven on oil. You know, they run our tractors, they make our pesticides, they ship from one place to another. That's all petrochemicals. And so our real salvation is doing not only food locally, but everything locally. And I think this is happening right now as I speak. And um, <coughs> for some of us who have been real interested in food and, and, and being sustainable for many years, there's just a wave of interest right now on growing local food uh, and being more local. So it's, uh, it's great to see that. Walnuts, and I mentioned that in yogurt. So uh, I'll have this book. And by the way, I'm going to be here afterwards. If you want to hang around, talk to me. I'll have some time for questions as well. Uh, I really love this book. And then later, a couple years later, he came out with a second book that he talks about living seasonably and how, how we should be eating seasonably. Uh, and, he, and, he, and he adds a, a few more uh, superfoods, and some of these are quite interesting, I think. Avocados, well, we ain't going to grow avocados here. Cinnamon, uh, he considers something that we should be eating almost every day, cinnamon. And it, what a great thing with apples, which is another one of his superfoods. Dark chocolate. Now that's a bummer, isn't it? I, mean, uh, I eat chocolate. I mean, I eat chocolate every day, not to excess, but uh, dark chocolate with not a lot of sugar, or you you can get just the raw nibs or the cacao, just the regular straight bean, and eat that with other little uh, some sweeter chocolate, and uh, and you get that uh, goodness. Extra virgin olive oil. Garlic, honey, who has bees? 
one person. Uh, bees are such a wonderful, wonderful thing uh, to have in your backyard. I'll show you a picture of, of uh, the bees that we, that we keep. Um, you know, we're extracting honey right now. It's a, it's a thrill to work with bees. They're such a fascinating group of animals to work with. Uh, when you pair them with chickens or compare them with, with other kind of mammals and birds, um, bees are, uh, are real fascinating. Kiwi, is he considers a superfood, onions and pomegranates. So some of these, like pomegranates, we can only get like a month or two, but when we have them, we really, uh, I really try to use a lot of them. So many of you raised your hand on growing some of your food. So most of you are growing the warm season crops. How many of you process those and preserve those so that you can grow, eat them year round? Okay, and canning is the way you do it? And drying. And freezing. And freezing. So let's compare all those. I think this is a really interesting um, thing to think about, especially since we live in the high desert. Uh, when we can things, like making jams and jellies and canning up tomatoes, it's a pretty intensive process in terms of energy. And then it, and it takes a little bit of space to, to, uh, to keep it. And it's cooked. It's no longer raw. And uh, I personally try to eat about 60 to 70 percent of my food is raw. And raw food is so good for us because it has all of the nutrients before they get cooked. So we really focus on two ways to preserve food in, uh, in our warm season crops. And one of them is drying. And right now we have a, a, a tunnel that's over in asphalt, I'll show you a picture, that we dry apples, all kinds of fruit, apples, pears, and, and tomatoes. We, any, everything we grow, we can dry zucchini, put some uh, salt and pepper and some spices on uh, zucchini, you know, you, so many of us have so much zucchini right now. Slice it about a quarter of an inch thick, lay it out in the sun, and uh, let the sun dry it, and it's, uh, there's no energy involved in drying food. So we're a really a big proponent of drying, and there's lots of information on how to dry vegetables and what sort of treatment to use for that. The other thing that we've really all got hooked on is probiotics, fermentation. And uh, the first thing that comes to mind is sauerkraut. Uh, sauerkraut is a fermented cabbage, and uh, of course the, the Germans lived on this uh, all winter long. Um, Can I interrupt for a second? Are you talking about hoop houses? Yes. Oh, you are? Yes. Okay. Sorry. We're, Thank you. Actually, there was two major subjects, superfoods and how to grow them year-round. So we're, right now we're talking about foods, and then we'll talk about uh, uh, low tunnels and hoop houses and low Okay, so there will be no change of speakers here. here. I'm yet. Okay. You're stuck with me. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting. Okay, no, that's all right. So, uh, what we've been doing is doing more of a, a product called kimchi. Kimchi is uh, a Korean fermented product, and it's so easy to make. And the nice thing about kimchi is you can use almost any vegetable you want. So, we, we use uh, uh, all of our root crops. Uh, we use, not, not lettuce really, but chard, kale, broccoli, cauliflower, um, uh, sometimes we throw in some burdock root, but uh, we chop these up pretty fine and put them into a, into a crock, that, you know, you can get really big crocks or little crocks, you can do them in a, in a wide mouth quart jar. And the only thing you add with this is salt. And, and some moisture, not very much moisture, and you beat it down so the juices are beat from these uh, products, and then you add salt, and um, and then you let it sit for about a week, and it's it's ready to eat, um, and it will last in the crock in a cool place for as long as it takes to eat it, um, and it doesn't take us long. We go through a crock about every month, and we eat it every lunch. So um, I would really encourage you to think about fermented uh, vegetables and 
again, they're wrong. And they're probiotic, so the, the, the organisms that convert that into something that's preservable is good for our, for our gut. And one comment, and then I'll ask, uh, what's ironic is the bacteria that does the work is present all over the world, and, it grow, and it's on every vegetable that grows in the, in the planet. And all it needs is a brine solution to convert this so that these vegetables will last for a long time. And to me, that's how nature protects all of us and works with us, because uh, nature is really trying to create a fertility and trying to create abundance. And to me, that's a good example of how that happens. Yeah? Uh, I know that cooking kills enzymes, but uh, drying and fermenting, that doesn't do that? No. And, and, and a, this is a very complex question, and I'm certainly not an expert on all this. But uh, I know that there are some things, like tomatoes, that you get when you cook them that you don't get when you're raw. So it's not a white and black kind of thing. It's, it's not a simple sort of thing. But as I understand, uh, when you ferment it, you still have all of the good things about it in that vegetable and as well as drying. Yeah. So that's a really a, a really nutritious way. Yeah. You, well, how do you beat the vegetables down? What do you mean when you say you beat them down? Uh, this, this is kind of a funny story. Uh, I, I grew up in a German community in northern Iowa. And my dad was German. And we had this wooden thing that was about this big around at the bottom and it was about that high and then it went down into a handle so it was like like a potato uh, masher so yeah it's like a potato masher except it was wood and it will fit into a wide mouth uh, gallon jar and that's what we do after we cut them up and grate them then we smash them put salt in at the right uh, quantity um, and Every level, like we go four or five inches, we'll put some salt, another four or five, and keep beating it, keep beating it. And this is why it's, it's a really a fun thing to do as a, it's like a barn raising. You know, you want to get your friends to bring their vegetables and you have a kimchi party and you all, because, you know, after a while, you get tired of, of uh, beating these up. <laughs> I have a question with people with having blood pressure problems and all of that salt and kidney problems, isn't that hard on people's kidneys? Could be. Yeah, because it is salty. Uh -huh. the, and sometimes, based on how much salt you put in, it's more salty than other times. Uh, but it is salt, and uh, I think that is consideration. And probably one of the things that that I do at least is I'll sprinkle kimchi over my salads. We eat a lot of salads anyway. And so I won't put dressing on it and I won't put any more salt. So if you don't add salt to your meal, then maybe that's your salt source. So that reduces your salt. But I'm sure that's that's the case. With, yeah, a lot of people. So I talked about nutrient dense. Um, let's t talk about that a little bit and then we'll talk about who houses. Um, <coughs> nutrient density has to do with how vegetables grow. And we've all read about how industrial agriculture crops are less nutrient now than they were 30 or 40 years ago. Because big ag really puts on a, a, just a two or three chemicals, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash, and they're just, you know, they're just feeding the plant directly. And the soil is just a growing medium. Uh, so what about these other hundred different nutrients that we should have in our soils? So uh, our, our food that we buy at, at the supermarket, if it's not organic, gets less nutrient dense. Even if it is organic, uh, it, it's, it's less nutrient dense. Um, so how do you make, make sure that things are more nutrient dense? Well, firstly, your soil is, is critical. And, and I think all growing is based on soil. And, and listen to Craig Witt, he'll sort of talk to you about the importance of, of soil. And, and we like to, the whole organic approach is feeding the soil, and then the soil feeds the plants. And uh, people ask me if I'm interested in hydroponics, and, and I've never been particularly interested in it because it, you're growing it in, you know, in a, in a water liquid that doesn't have all of these complex nutrients that are in our soil. 
So uh, I think that's part of it. And then um, I think another part is every crop has different requirements. Tomatoes, you know, like a little bit different kind of soil condition than lettuce, for example. So it's good to research that and know what your crops really want on it in your soil. Soil sampling is important. Um, but just looking at the plant, and it turns out, and this took me years to really be convinced that it, if your plants are growing and they're healthy and they're nutrient rich, insects don't get to them so much. You know, once they get older, like one of the things we grow a lot of kale because kale is a wonderful cancer preventative. And it's, it's a lot easier to grow than cabbage and we can grow, get a lot more out of kale than we can out of head of cabbage. So it does really well, but once it gets like a year old or a year, a little bit older than a year, it starts getting, losing its vigor. The aphids just, I don't know if you've seen these little woolly blue aphids that love kale and, and once that happens, then it goes to the chickens. So you always have some new crops coming up. So I think it's important to know what crop you are growing and, and get the soil. But then at the end, uh, I'm at a farmer's market and I'm telling you that this food's really nutrient dense and you look at me and say, well, how do you know it's nutrient dense? So who's heard of a refractometer? Some of you. A refractometer is really a very simple tool and what it does is you put some sap on this little window here and hold it to the sun and you can see a line that tells how much sugar that that is in that sample. And sugar is the best indicator of nutrient density. And think about it. Think about a tomato and you have five tomatoes in, and they go from green to really ripe and just perfect. And which ones are sweeter? So that sweetness is a really good indicator of nutrient density. So it's fun. Uh, we, we're at a market and somebody's from California has got these tomatoes, you know, that have probably been picked when they're, you know, green and they've been shipped up here and, and been around for a, a couple, three, four days and we picked our tomatoes that day. And just get a tomato over there and check the density. And these are, you know, they're less than 100 bucks. And uh, we also use these, uh, and maybe $100 sounds like a lot, but, you know, how much does it cost you to go to the doctor? How much are you spending on your, your medications? You know, um, I'm in my 70s. I don't take medications. I rarely go to the doctor. And so I can afford a little piece of tool here that's less than $100. All right, so uh, any other questions on food? And then we're going to rest over the top. We're going to talk about how do we grow this food year round. So, any questions about superfoods? Yeah. yeah. Just who's the author of those books that you wrote? Yes. Uh, well, Pratt. Uh, Stephen Pratt. And uh, uh, so, you know, we all need gurus. And uh, uh, Stephen Pratt's a guru. My, my other main guru is Elliot Coleman. Yeah. Uh, and if any of you are serious about growing food year-round, this is the book. He's written three books. Um, he's famous all over the country. Uh, he spoke in Reno, just a, had a, a huge crowd. Uh, this is the book that's written for small scale homeowner and small scale growers like me. Um, and it's uh, called The Winter Harvest Handbook um, and Elliot Coleman. So I'll have this book up here. And um, a lot of what I'm, I'm going to talk about, we really learned from, from Elliot Coleman. Question? Yes. You didn't mention freezing. Does that pertain to nutrients? Well, that's good. Thank you for bringing me back. I think freezing is really good for for small quantities of things, but freezing just takes a lot of energy. When you compare the cost of keeping a freezer going, uh, and I understand too, and I just kind of learned this that if if you have a really good modern freezer and you hardly ever open the door on it, it's a lot less energy than if you're opening the door every day, like a refrigerator. So I think those are helpful to, you know, to learn. I don't freeze, I do freeze my birds when we, when we harvest uh, like five 
people bring us roosters all the time because they have these chickens and then they can't have a rooster and the neighbor complains that we have roosters and of course you have three or four roosters and they just beat the hens up. So you have to eat the roosters and we tell people, you know, if you're going to bring a rooster over, we're, going to, we're ultimately going to eat it. Um, but we get all geared up and we get some friends over, we get our whole staff over and we'll do like five or six or seven or eight birds at once. So we'll freeze those. So I think that's a really good uh, way to use your freezer. Another thing that we do, we freeze some of our juices. Um, I used to tell people uh, the last couple of years that uh, 2009 was our best fruit year in Reno that I'd ever experienced. This year is twice what it was overnight. This all over is a phenomenal fruit year. And um, so one of the things one of the things, we're on the river and we have a lot of choke cherries. And uh, choke cherry is an interesting uh, cherry because it grows all the way across from east to west, from coast to coast. On the northern latitudes, choke cherries grow, and so there's lots of information about it. I grew up uh, with my grandmother making choke cherry jelly, and we'd go out and pick choke cherries. And so we did that this year big time. We picked. Uh, uh, 62 pounds at one time, and then about 40 pounds uh, the second time, and we still have we could, uh, have some more. We go down to uh, Reno Home Brewer, and maybe you have a place like that here where you can take them, and they, they juice them for you. And it just, it takes out so much of the work. Because I can remember, you know, at home where we'd cook the fruit, we put it through a colander, and we'd finally get the juice, and then we could, you know, do something with it. But, God, you take it to the home brew, and if, and if you take enough, we take both apples and uh, choke cherries, and the apples are chopped up and they're put in this juicer, and within an hour, you've got, uh, well, the last time we came back, we had about 15 gallons of juice. Now, some of that we're going to make things with, value-added products, syrup, choke cherry, jam, and so forth, but other, other ones we're going to uh, sell to uh, to stores and to especially people that make drinks and make juices, um, because uh, it's a native it's a native plant. Um, two years ago, I made quite a bit of choke cherry jam, and an Indian bought one, took it home. His mother sent it back, say buy everything he has, <laughs> because it was like sentimental. Because the Indians lived on choke cherry all winter long. That was their main that was their main fruit. What time is it? How, how am I doing? It's uh. 1.30. Okay, good. All right. Um, so let's talk about the crops. And I divide crops into kind of two categories mainly. And, and I think most people do cool season and warm season. And uh, let me just read them to you because I think you're going to know pretty much all of the warm season crops, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, uh, green beans, um, cucumbers. What are the other warm season crops you can grow in the summer? You can grow cool season crops anytime. But warm season crops, you know, after the first killing frost, you're done, right? So those are the warm season crops. Uh, squash, pumpkin. Uh, cool season crops, um, first I like to think of which ones are in the cabbage family. Why do I care about that? Full of antioxidants. It's been proven over and over and over again that they prevent cancer. Uh, so we should really be thinking about eating cabbage family plants. So here they are. Kale is probably our, our main one. Broccoli, cabbage, those are two uh, don't grow a lot because they take so much time. Collards. I love to grow collards. Collards give me four or five times the, the cabbage than, than a cabbage would. So collards are really fun to grow. Bok choy, all of the Asian greens. Tatsoi, there's a whole range of Asian greens. And the interesting thing about Asian greens is that they're leafy. They're like lettuce. So you can put them into a leafy salad, and yet they're in the cabbage family. So we're real big on, on that. Another group that I like to think about is uh, spinach, uh, beets, and um, spinach, beets, and Swiss chard. Swiss chard is a real workhorse for our winter gardens. Who grows Swiss chard? 
Yeah. Um, and, and I'm going to talk about timing because timing is really important. Those three plants are all related. Uh, in Europe, they call Swiss chard um, red beet, I think, or some kind of a beet. So spinach, chard, and beets are all in the same group of plants. And they all have the same nutrient package that other, all other vegetables don't have. So we should be eating one of those three or four times a week. Um, spinach is a crop that I, I put um, with another way to divide crops is when you plant these so you can have winter harvest. Okay, So chard, kale, collards, uh, the things that get bigger, that last a long time, you need to be starting those plants in your garden in August if you want to harvest them throughout the winter. Because they need a month or two or three to really get some, some growth before you start protecting them. Um, things like lettuce, spinach, Asian greens, I've seeded in November and harvested in February and in March. So there are some of these things that you seed that, that mature quickly, you can seed throughout the year and throughout the winter. But those ones that I just mentioned, it's critical. And, and years that I haven't done that, uh, and, we, and we're, you know, we're selling year-round to, to uh, the co-op and to restaurants, and we don't have collards, chard, and kale, we're in trouble because they're just really the workhorses of these cool season crops. Then I, I like to list another group of plants that you can get started earlier on but harvest all winter long. Those are all the root crops. And beets is one we've mentioned. That's similar to the chard and the spinach. But carrots, radish uh, are all really good plants to get started now and then you mulch them and you can harvest carrots all winter long uh, from the soil. So I think those are important crops as well. Uh, turnips is another one. A lot of people don't like turnips, but the greens are, are just super, really. And they're a cabbage family. Turnip is a cabbage family. So is a radish is a cabbage family. So all those are really, really good. Uh, and then other groups of superfoods are the garlic and the onions. And I think, who grows garlic here? Yeah. I, I went to a sort of a health class, and this lady had high credentials, and she was a midwife, and she lost a baby. And she felt so terrible about it, she went to med school. And she got out, and now she's on the National uh, Herbal Council. And she stood up and said, we need to eat garlic every day. Garlic is truly an awesome, awesome food to keep us healthy, to keep us strong every day. You know, it doesn't matter how long you live. If your life is quality when you're eating it, then that's important. So I really make a, uh, a point of putting garlic in my salads. We cook with garlic. Raw garlic is the best, and you should eat a clove a day. And just make sure your spouse does that too. <laughs> Um, so garlic, scallions, and uh, onions, uh, onions are another superfood, you should be eating them both. Scallions is something we can grow year round, and especially in the winter time. Uh, and uh, you know, scallions is a little onion. Alright, so let's shift gears here. Uh, I want to talk about uh, low tunnels, floating row covers, mid tunnels, and high tunnels. And uh, as Rick Latin was uh, from Latin Farms was talking at Patagonia at a uh, slow food meeting and he said uh, row covers, low tunnels and high tunnels are revolutionizing growing in the high desert and he's certainly true because without this we, you can't grow in winter time uh, and this is a, a, a product and this is one sort of slice of it. It's called Agrabon. And it actually comes in four different widths or, or, or thicknesses. Some of the Agrabon is used 
uh, all summer long just for insect control. And it's grown and it's, and it's floated over the cover of your plant. So as the plants grow, it just raises the cover. And you have it securely uh, uh, secured with rocks or with soil on the edges so the wind doesn't blow along. So this is a floating row cover. And the heavier ones give you more frost protection but reduce the light. That's what's remarkable about the high desert. You know, we need to look at where we are and take advantage of our conditions. And who has the sun in the wintertime than we do? I mean, uh, this is what's remarkable about any high desert around the planet is we have lots of winter sun. And that's why we can grow in the wintertime. But getting back to uh, Agrabon, so uh, Agrabon uh, 50, I think is called, is will take out 50% of the light, but will protect you from uh, frost from about six or seven degrees. And then the mid ones will let in 75% of the light, but they only give you like three, three percent. Uh, I mean, three degrees protection. But really, we don't need to protect winter crops from freezing. We just can't go out and harvest them when they're frozen. And we do this all the time in the wintertime, is at 8 o'clock in the morning, all of our crops are frozen underneath this or in our tunnels. Uh, but by 11 o'clock, we can go out and harvest them because they're, they're not frozen. Anymore. And that's what makes a cool season crop a cool season crop, is that it can freeze and still keep on growing. The growth slows, so that's why you have to have some of these really growing before you get into the wintertime. But they continue to grow, and they continue to have the nutrients that we're, they're all looking for. So floating row cover. Where do you find that at? Uh, probably the best place, uh, Johnny's Seed will sell it. And Johnny's, I mean, it's a long way to ship it, but sometimes they'll be. The other place is uh, Peaceful Valley. Peaceful Valley is just over the hill in Nevada City. And they're a big organic supplier, and they sell this material. Uh, and I think you can get it at a Hungry Mother. Yeah, I think you can. Yeah. And he would order it for you. Hungry Mother, um, I'm in awe of Mark, by the way. Mark is, is awesome, and um, he really knows his stuff. Uh, is bringing in the opportunity for people on the highway to get some organic food. So um, I'm sure maybe some of you have taken classes there. He, uh, he and his staff are, uh, are inspiration for me. Where's this location? It's just, well, Linda, where? It's across from the Silver City RV part where um, Full Circle is. <coughs> on 395, oh, it's on 395, just south of Carson City. Well, if you're in a truck, you come to us. I'll get you some. Yeah, we're just off. South of what? If you go north on 395, just before you go up the hill, uh -huh. yes. it's on the left-hand side. Okay, right there. This is number nine wire. Um, it comes in uh, sort of hoops like this. You can get it at Lowe's and Home Depot and Ace. I don't know about Ace, but I hate. I, actually, I like to. Everything I can buy locally, I try to buy locally, even if I have to spend a little. Uh, but I can't get this uh, locally. So um, this is the wire that they use under a chain link fence. So they always have it. And, uh, it. and so what we do is we kind of measure it and then we make three little loops in it just by wrapping it around. We have a loop in the center and this is new because um, I didn't have these before and I'll show you with what happens. And then there's a loop here and there's a loop here. And then what we do is everything we grow is in a 30 inch bed. Uh, and you'll see this when I show the slides. It's in a 30 inch bed and they have three or four grip lines running down. And the longer the bed, the better. If you're real serious about growing winter food because you need to cover it. And the longer the run, the lot easier it is to cover it. Uh, so we put these about every four foot. If you're high in Truckee, I don't know. This, I don't know if this is going to work in Truckee. 
Yeah, it's, um, it's tougher to try. If you, if you were in a banana belt, you'd probably have to put these every two feet because the snow will smash them down, especially heavy snow. Um, I'll show you my amphitheater. I had uh, vegetables growing there about five years ago, and we had like a snow and then another snow and then another snow. And a month and a half later, we finally dug this out, and all of our vegetables in there were just fine. You know, there some of them were smashed down, but they were they were had grown and they were they were just fine. So the purpose of the of these two out here is. You tie a string onto this, okay? The other one's four feet, right? So string here, then the string goes over and goes through the one on this side, and then back over and back over. So it's going back and forth, and that keeps your row cover from flying up and down. Then later we put this in, and what I have is a, a, a piece of string that we tie to each one of these. I use a clove hitch, tie to each one of these, and at the end, it goes down to a stake. And these help from the winter time because it gives them support this way. What happens in the snow without these is the snow bends them down this way. But here it doesn't because they can't go this way. They have to push down this way. Um, and then you stick these in the ground uh, up, to the, up to the hoop. So that's called a low tunnel. Low tunnels are a twentieth of the cost of growing year-round than a hoop house. Think about it, you know. What's the difference between, in terms of the plant, what's the difference between this and growing in a, in a, in a uh, hoop house? Well, you're in the hoop house, and the plants are in it. Here, you're not in here. You're, you're guarding from the outside. So the difference between a low tunnel and a high tunnel is the low tunnels are just for plants, and uh, we have a, about 14 inches between our rows. 14 inches, 30 inches. 14 inches, 30 inches, as long as you can make them. And if you cover these with Agrabon, you'll be able to grow year round. If you cover them with plastic, and the plastic we use is described, you can get this plastic in, in these places that I mentioned, is it's called four year six mil. Four year meaning it will last four years in our UV conditions. And six mil means it's tough. Six mil plastic is really tough. Um, it will withstand wind uh, as long as you can keep it from flopping off and you really need to make sure it's secure to this. How do you attach it to those hoops? That's what I was just saying. With the string. And then what I do on the plastic when we use plastic, there's a, there's a double-edged sword about the plastic. In February, when it got down to, let's say, 25 degrees, and it's full sun, by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, if you don't vent that plastic, you're going to fry the plants. The nice thing about Agrabon is it, it never, that never happens. So plastic, you've got to manage it. But plastic, you can grow a lot more in the wintertime than you can with Agrabon because it really heats up. And it heats up the soil, and if your soil is really warm when it goes into night, it will keep the plants from freezing. And if you keep the plants from freezing, then they'll grow more. So what I do is the plastic we, we use, and it comes in all different widths. It's usually like 100 feet by 7 or four, and now most of it's about seven feet. We'll take one edge and put it into the soil and put soil on it. And then that's really secure. And then we always garden from the other edge. And the neat thing about this is that you can slip the agribond or the plastic over the hoops to work on it, but still the strings on top. So you don't have to take the string out to take this plastic back and forth or the agribond. And you need to do that to harvest, and you need to do it to, you know. When you, when you start growing in winter after about the middle of November, people say, well, where am I going to get water? I have to turn my irrigation system. Well, plants require a lot less water growing in the wintertime than they do in the summer. Secondly, your humidity is 
reason higher. And the main, if you said one reason, one reason why you use uh, floating row covers or tunnels would be to keep the wind off. You have to keep the wind off crops in the winter or you got nothing. And you've all seen this. You know, you got something really nice and after a big storm and a big wind, the wind is what really desiccates the plants. This keeps the wind off and, uh, and that allows you, but it also does a few, it also does a few other things. It raises your humidity and uh, uh, it creates an environment where you don't have a lot of insects. Looks like I've talked way too, way too long. Uh, let's let's uh, go through the slides really quick. See if we can uh, get it dark enough to see it. And thanks for the for the warning. You can just shut that. Oh, that's the last one. Can we? I don't know. Can you, I can go backwards? Oh, I'm sorry. First one. Where do you want to go? Okay, that's the first one. That's, that, that was the first one. Good. So we grow in three, four different locations. All of our locations are less than a half an acre, a quarter acre or less. Uh, we grow very, very intensive. And this is a, our biggest operation is at Hug High School, which is a high school in Reno. And, uh, we started with this hillside and another hillside um, for for growing, and they were, wanted to reduce their water use. So we got funded by the, our water purveyor, Truckee Meadow Water Authority, and they paid us to do something else with this lawn uh, that ran off so much water. Okay. Oh, that that wasn't the next one. That's the next one. Is that, is that good? You, I wherever you want to go. Okay, just the neck. Just uh, keep them in line there. So, uh, one of the things we built was a food forest there, which a food forest is just like a regular forest. Except everything in it is for people to eat, or for beneficial insects to eat. So we have uh, uh, fruit trees, and then we have berry bushes under that, and then we have herbs and strawberries under that. That's called a food forest, and that's what we did here. Okay. Now that's the last picture. <laughs> okay, that was, that's a good one. <laughs> so this is what row covers look like in the field. And uh, uh, these are 30 inches, 14 inches, 30 inches, 14 inches. And you can see the string going back and forth. Okay? Good. Uh, I want to show you this. Uh, we have three laterals here. Uh, we use Netafim drip. Uh, Netafim's nice because the emitters are in the pipe. Can everybody see? Am I standing? Just holler if I'm uh, standing in front. Uh, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll, we'll do one foot on center or eight inches on center here and six inches on center here with the idea of growing bigger crops in the middle and smaller things that we have to harvest more on the edges. Uh, okay. This is, uh, uh, you can see that this is not winter time yet, but uh, this is our first crop there. You can really see uh, the wires, and uh, this was carrots, and then this was uh, chard and spinach, okay? Uh, we work with the kids, we work with the students, uh, teaching them where food comes from, okay? Uh, this is uh, part of the river school, and this is what we call our amphitheater. We do a lot of weddings and parties there. But one year I grew uh, vegetables in these spaces between where people sort of sit. And uh, I mentioned earlier, these are the row covers, just floating row covers. It was impossible to get hoops there. The row covers really served as well, okay? Uh, showing, that's, that's a drip emitter inside the pipe. And this is some of our lettuce, okay? Uh, this is, a product called cat soy. It's an Asian grain. I mentioned it's in the cabbage family. Look at the dark green leaves on it. This is one of the cold, hardiest plants that there is. You can grow this in February quite nicely. And it tastes really good. Okay? Uh, this is another Asian grain called Mizuna. You heard of Mizuna? Everybody's heard of Mizuna? This is one of our biggest producers in the wintertime. 
and so we love the Mizuno, and it's got a nice crisp flavor, and uh, again, it's got lots of nutrients, okay? Would you spell that? Yeah, we do. We sell all these things. Would you spell that? <laughs> oh, what did you say? Would you spell that? Oh, Mazuna. M-A-Z-U-N-A. -A. And I, I'll tell you, I'm not maybe the world's worst speller, but I'm close to it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds right. You know, when we, you know, you, when we grew up, at, at least um, I graduated in 58 from high school, and I was always one of the first or second people that would sit down in a spelling bee. It just depended on if Bob Shizzle was before me or after me. <laughs> um, this is a, a apartment complex that we're, we just have four rows in the front. And it's kind of in the shade, but uh, this is an example of just a small area. You know, for a family, you don't need a lot to grow greens in the wintertime. You don't need a lot of space, okay? Um, Last year we had a raw food challenge uh, for one month at the River School. We had people that would come and every week they would bring a raw food recipe. We talked about the value of raw food. Um, you know, raw food is really good for us, so that's an example of that. Okay. Uh, this is my mobile chicken coop, and I moved this out into the wedding garden after the last wedding. So November, December, January, February, March, April, about six months of the year, my chickens are on the lawn all winter long. And uh, uh, they keep giving me eggs and they fertilize the lawn and people will like to see them and so forth. So uh, we've got about four more weddings and then the chickens will be on the lawn, okay? Uh, I mentioned beekeeping. We have beekeeping classes. I think there's a beekeeping class here today. Yes. Uh, so uh, uh, fascinating, uh, just uh, we have love bees. Um, this year was really fun for me because I, I'm learning how to catch swarms, and that's how you build your hives. And this year, because we had a fairly mild winter, and our, my bees actually, a lot of them went to California, so they didn't have to be here all winter long. But the bees here, there was a lot of swarming. Uh, so in one week, I caught six swarms, and I went from four to 14. Uh, so, this is a raised bed, really inexpensive raised bed out of straw bales, and, uh, and again it has uh, hoops made out of uh, PVC and, and the same kind of drip, okay? Uh, this is inside what I call a mid-tunnel, and I don't have time to explain why mid-tunnel, but mid-tunnels you get into, but you, you're on your hands and knees. <coughs> which is great for me because I don't like to bend over anyway, so uh, it's, good, it's good to garden on your hands and knees, okay? This is another slotted plastic, and this gives you a lot of advantages of plastic, but it bends, and you can get this in China. So we've been using this a lot in November, December to get a, a, a start, to get some protection, get a, a quick start on our uh, crops. You can see it straight back and forth, okay? Um, this is our farm crew. We have interns uh, every every uh, year, a number of interns. We're harvesting all, we're harvesting together. Um, and one of the things we do is we eat together both breakfast and lunch and talk about the day and talk about food. And this is one of the things that, that I'm just really interested in is teaching other people this, this valuable information. So this is one of the ways we do that, okay? Whoops. Um, oh, okay. This is a this is a tunnel. This is a really expensive tunnel. Um, Steve and Marcia showed us how to build these tunnels. Uh, they they garden in Dayton. Uh, this is a an inexpensive, non real fancy uh, uh, hoop house, and we put a fancy door in. <laughs> okay. And we bend it, and we and we have uh, shade cloth on it. Shake cloth's going to come off soon, okay? Is that PVC pipe? This is EMT. No, I don't. I try not to use PVC if I can. I use very little bit. This is electrical conduit, three quarter inch electrical conduit. Mm -hmm. You bend it over a form or just kind of hand bend it? Hand bend it. Yep. And then 
Unlike commercial hoop houses, this has a beam down the center. And this, what I do if it's really wet snow is I'll go out three or four times and push it out. Okay? Uh, these are our starts, getting ready for, uh, for later. Okay? Do you find you wake up in the middle of winter and like a really heavy snow? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, otherwise you wake up in the morning. No, I, well, it hasn't yet. It, and, but it could. I think it could. Yeah, for wet snow, it could. Yeah. Uh, this is our chicken feed. We actually buy chicken feed locally from uh, a grain grower and then we soak it and sprout it and give it to our chickens. Okay? And uh, a low tunnel or mid tunnel with crops in it. Okay? How? I've heard like about a 25%, 40% I don't we don't we just do eggs. I used to I did one I can try to flush that later. I did one crop of meat birds and I don't I'll never do it again. Uh, peas, we got this was just taken yesterday, okay? And we cut we we have two compost operations, we cover them to keep them warm, okay? Uh, we have a, a we're milking her and this is my uh, pet goat. Okay, and chickens. Uh, this is the pulp from what we're juicing that we're going to dry and then feed to wildlife or, or wild stock at the winter time. Okay, and you can see the tunnel covered. Uh, this is inside. We're drying. This is our drying operation over asphalt. Okay. Uh, we store things in this um, uh, little hobbit house here and keep it cool. We open it at night, put a fan in, and close it during the day. It stays cool. Okay. Uh, we harvest rainwater and use it in the wintertime in that bed, okay? Um, we get more money for our feathers than we do for our eggs, okay? Um, here's the apothecary and we're starting seeds, okay? Amphitheater, one more. We're getting close, one more. Rainwater again, okay? Okay. This is a cob oven, okay? Chickens. Good Lord, where did I get all these slides? <laughs> this is our CSA box, okay? Uh, peaches from our trees, okay? Grapes. Oh, Back to the beginning. We missed it, but that's all right. Uh, I had a picture of kids. Uh, we do kids' camps, and uh, it's, it's real easy to, to love kids and to want to teach them about gardening, and I think this is something we need to do. But I think that one of the strategies for making this planet a better place is just love each other and, and care for our neighbors and care for each other. Because when we love each other and care for each other, then perhaps we're not going to you know, pollute our water and do all these other things. So thank you very much for listening.